Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. My name is Andy. I am the uh, executive director here at New Ventures BC, and uh, I won the New Ventures BC competition presented by Innovate BC. So thank you for joining us. Uh, today's topic, government grants and financial models. We've got two great speakers here, Eric Koss from NRC IRAP and Sean Hodgins from Tandem Innovation. Uh, so before I hand it over to them, I'll just go through my kind of housekeeping sponsor slides and then we'll get into it. Uh, okay, so first, this is our, we're in the middle of our seminar series. So like I said, today's government grants financial models. We've got more coming up kind of at least weekly. So there's a few where we have two in a week coming up. Uh, so please continue to join us uh, every week or watch online. Uh, past sessions I've got on the bottom there. Those are things we've already done. So you're welcome to catch up on uh, the, the seminars uh, online on our, on our YouTube or off of our website. Uh, also, in the programming note next week, it's going to be on Tuesday, not Wednesday. So Tuesday, we'll send a reminder. But um, uh, yeah, okay. sp speaker, speaker issue, that's all. All right, so New Ventures BC ourselves, we are a not-for-profit. We are here to work with tech startups, early stage tech startups. So we are most known for the competition of which I know many of you are in. Uh, we also have a year-round a distance venture accelerator program. This is a regular mentorship program where clients can meet with um, with uh, mentors to to work on their their business on a more kind of structured way. Uh, we also have our Discovery Foundation Sales Accelerator happening now. We have one final cohort for that particular program starting in uh, June. So if uh, you're in revenue and that might be of interest, please check that out. And we have a whole bunch of online course offerings via our market validation training program. So, and those are all free. So newventuresbc.com, you can get all the info there. A uh, bunch of community events coming up. I will, uh, once I get out of this PowerPoint deck and pass it over to the speakers, I will, I will put all the links into the chat. Uh, but these are just some partner events coming up that I thought I would just help amplify. A few of them, Thai Angels, Angel Forum, they've given us a discount code for uh, just cheaper access to tickets. Again, just a friend, I get no kickbacks. So just check out what you want, but they're nice enough to give uh, to give discount codes. So, uh, so feel free to use those as well. Um, the video, we record the session. We also uh, do share the slides. So they are on our website. Uh, off of our blog. If you go to our website uh, on our homepage, you'll see a, a seminars button or a seminars link. And if you click on that, they'll take you to the page. It's got all the videos, all the links to all the slides, or you can look it up on YouTube. Uh, okay, I'm going to make my sponsors and then I'll, I'll uh, introduce the speakers. So our lead partner title sponsor is Innovate BC. Our gold sponsors, EY, Faskin, SFU, BD School of Business, UBC Sutter School of Business, Silver sponsors, Ace Tech, Telus Ventures, Output, uh, Vantag, Angel Network, and Volition. For those in the competition, Output is our platform for our round two submission and judging, which I will get out details on today, I promise. Uh, and we have lots of great bronze sponsors who are all uh, service providers or accelerators here uh, supporting tech companies as well. So please check them out along with our media sponsors who are always here looking for great stories on startups. And if you want to get in touch, this is how you reach, re reach me. So feel free to get in touch after this. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing here. And for the agenda today, Eric, you can start sharing. Uh, we've got two speakers. First up, we have Eric Koss, who is a ITA from NRC IRAP, and Eric is going to go through uh, programs related to IRAP, uh, government, uh, government grant options and funding programs, because, you know, one of the number one questions you're going to get as a startup is, well, ha have you gotten any, have you raised any government money? And if you haven't, why the heck not, right? So Eric's going to take you through all of that and the different resources that you have available to yourself as, as a Canadian startup. And that's going to be about 30 minutes. And then after that, we've got Sean Hodgins here from Tandem Innovation. And Sean's going to go through uh, financial models 
And Sean has uh, been a, both a volunteer for the competition, so on the side of the mentor judge, and also has been in the competition. So he will share his perspectives on all that as well. So very, very uh, thankful to have you both here. And I'm going to hand it over to you, Eric, to get started. Okay, thank you, Angie. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I'm, uh, I'm Eric. I'm an industrial technology advisor, or ITA. You'll probably hear that term out and about quite often uh, with IRAP. Um, and today I'll talk about uh, getting funding from government programs, um, which is not always as easy as uh, people think it is, but it's, uh, it's something that you can definitely take advantage of to, to leverage any other funding you have uh, received. And, and as always, Dilbert is usually right about real life. Um, so we see there's a lot where companies uh, have not much except an idea, which usually doesn't set you up well for any anything, but uh, it also applies to government funding. But I'll get into that in a bit more detail. So today I'll talk a bit about just government programs in general, kind of what, uh, what you look for, what they look for, and uh, some of the, the basic table stakes that you need to, to start qualifying for them. Uh, I'll go in a bit more detail on the best program out there, not that I'm biased, but NRC IRAP. And then I'll uh, review some of the other main programs that a lot of earlier stage startups can tap into. And then it, at the end, we'll do some questions. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to start entering them in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll answer them afterwards uh, on, or on the fly. And uh, hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a good understanding of where you kind of need to be at uh, to start being able to tap into some of the government programs. So first I'll, first I'll go over some of the truth and myths of government funding. There's a lot of uh, misinformation out there um, that we try to dispel. And one of them, and this, this goes back to the Dilbert uh, cartoon there, is that um, if, if you have this great idea that the government is going to mag magically give you a lot of money to to make it a reality. Um, we don't really, there's, I don't think there's any program out there that really provides what would be the equivalent of seed funding. Um, we usually need you to put a little bit of table stakes in the, in the company, either bootstrap yourself to a certain stage or get some family and friends money. But uh, yeah, don't, don't count on the government to seed your company. That, that doesn't really happen. The other thing is that, uh, and even Angie said that, it's like it's easy to get the grants, like your investors expect it. Uh, but that's not always the case, right? Um, a lot of them are competitive in nature. They have limited funds and, uh, and there's a selection process. So, um, and then any grant, you're going to have to do some effort on it to make sure that you qualify. You have to do the paperwork, uh, make sure that you uh, meet all the requirements. Uh, but the good thing is there's a lot of grants out there, a lot of different programs. So hopefully you'll be able to find the ones that are the right fit at uh, based on the stage where you're at. Uh, the other one we hear a lot is that a lot of the grants are sort of tech based, high tech based. Um, hopefully all of you given, given the MVBC competition are tech companies, so it makes it easier. Uh, but there are a lot of grants available for sort of any kind of company uh, to help you hire people, to provide loans, to start up your own business. Uh, so it's not just pure technology based. Um, but there's some grants that obviously are a better fit for tech companies, but uh, there's, there's, a, there's a broad set of grants that uh, any company can tap into. And then finally, people kind of think of government funding as, as sort of free money. Uh, for some programs, they are contributions. Uh, but there's a, there's a broad variety, right? Some of them are loans uh, or you need to uh, repay them if and when you get into revenues. Uh, most of them are matching. So you need to, need to cover part of the cost yourself. Uh, so yeah, it's not always the easy, quick, free money, but, uh, but there are some grants that are definitely very attractive in, in, in helping you offset very short-term cost. So... The next one is just a sort of a list of things that you probably need to have in order to start qualifying. Now, this is this is not black and white, right? This really depends on each program, uh, but but this just gives you some thought about on what a lot of the programs are looking for, right? So the, the big one is, of course, uh, be Canadian, um, 
and and be registered here. A lot of them are for for profit companies. Um, and then most grants, you need to have less than 500 employees to be qualified as a small to medium enterprise. Um, even though I said not, not all grants are for tech companies, there are lots that are looking specifically to stimulate innovation. Um, so you need to be doing something that either uses technology or develops a new technology, um, or even if you're entering a new market, right? So you need to do something that, uh, that obviously has the potential to allow you to grow your company, create new jobs. That's what most of the government funding is for us to, to help companies achieve that. Um, we see a lot of people that kind of are, they're fully employed with another company and they have their startup on the side, uh, which isn't really a great fit in many cases. You kind of need to be full-time engaged. Um, do you have a team here? And, and very important is that, that you're hiring in Canada, right? So if you're using overseas contractors, um, or have other employees outside of Canada that doesn't get Canadian government programs very excited, right? We're looking to help you to grow your business in Canada and create jobs here. Um, in many cases, you need to either provide it in writing or, or be able to talk to people about your business plan, right? Like, well, like what is your actually plan? What are you gonna do? Uh, document what, uh, what, what your growth plans are. Um, some programs, can use a lean business canvas, which is sort of the lighter version. And of course, if you if you don't have any of this, I highly recommend that you go to the, uh, the, the market validation programs that NVPC offers and other similar programs, just to sort of put some thought into it, have, have a plan where you where you address all of the different parts of, of the product, go to market, how are you gonna finance this? How are you gonna hire people? Right? You just need to be able to um, explain that to the persons that you expect to provide funding to you. Um, like I said, most programs are not fully 100% covering all your costs. So you need to be able to um, either cover the cost up front and then be able to claim it. Um, and in most cases, the, the grants wouldn't cover more than uh, 50 or 75%. So you need to have a little bit of money available to, uh, to float the business, uh, cash flow the expenses, um, and provide the matching funds, right? Um, a, a pure cashless company is usually not uh, great at being able to uh, to tap into the funds, but uh, yeah, you need to have something there to, uh, to provide the matching. And then you also need to know what you want to do with the funding. It depends a bit on the program and, and the type of funds it is, but uh, yeah, again, it goes back to the plan. If we give you funding, what, what are you going to do with it? What's the impact going to be? All right, so have that, have that good understanding of what it is that you're looking to do. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an understanding. Um, what I'll do next is talk about NRC IRAP, and I go in a bit more details of what we look for, and then, uh, then what we provide. But yeah, a lot of the things that we look for is, is what I just covered. Um, so the official name for NRC IRAP, so we're part of the National Research Council. Um, and the program name is the Industrial Research Assistance Program. It's been around since after World War II when it was uh, introduced to help uh, stimulate the, uh, the, indus the industry in Canada. Um, the application period, a lot of people ask me what's the best time to apply to IRAP. Um, and I always tell them it's now, right? Like, like contact IRAP. Uh, you'll get put in touch. If, if you kind of meet some of the, the basic requirements, you'll get put in touch with myself or one of my colleagues, one of the ITA advisors. Um, and then it's about building that relationship, right? Like don't expect us to write you a check in the first meeting. Um, you need to build a relationship. And then over time, as we see how you progress and, and see how you fit with some of the programs uh, that, we, that we provide, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll support you. But it's, it's, it's all about building that relationship over time. Um, like I said, and that's, that is better done earlier than later um because we just want to see how you're progressing and how you uh how you move forward um, and the main reason for that is because since all of you guys are operating in nbc and probably a lot of them in the lower mainland it's a very competitive market here um irap has a set budget each year and we have way more companies apply for funding than we can uh, than we can support so we it's, it's my job and my colleague's job to find the best companies to to support that have the, the most potential to, uh, to grow in Canada and create jobs. 
Um, and again, that's that. That's why you want to have that relationship with with the ITA and and can demonstrate that you know how to grow a business, that you can execute, that you're going after a an attractive market. Um, but yeah, the 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 odds of getting IRAP funding is uh, is is a little bit less in Vancouver. It's the the second most competitive market after Toronto. Uh, so you're gonna have to work pretty hard. But as I'll 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 talk about in the next slide, there's there's some programs that are a little bit easier to tap into. That, uh, that a lot of companies can take advantage of that are part of the IRAP program. So when you work with IRAP, um, the main thing that we actually provide to companies and any company that we work with can, can, can uh, get benefits from this is advisory services, right? So everybody that works at IRAP that you'll work with has been in business. They, 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 they've all had careers as entrepreneurs themselves. Um, so they have experience, they have networks. Um, so when you start working with an advisor, the first thing we do is how can we help you with some advice on, on what to do next, what makes sense, uh, refer you to, to other organizations or, or, or provide some help. And like I said, any company can get that. Now, I realize that most people, when they contact IRAP, are doing that to, to get money, right? To help you grow your business. Um, and that's where it gets a little bit more, more detail oriented because we have different types of, of money and funding through which we can help uh, companies. So here's a bit of a, a list of the different types that you can tap into. Um, some are easier, some are a bit harder to get. Uh, the, the first one, I call it sort of the R&D project funding is kind of the, the, the main bulk of our funding is to help companies accelerate their R&D projects. So that is the very competitive part of IREP because that uh, those are typically larger projects and, and, and we select the companies that we think have the, the highest upside. Um, but we also provide, uh, we get money from Employment Canada. So we provide youth employment hiring grants and some years we get a lot, some years we get a little, but, uh, but those are available for companies as well. So it allows you to hire a recent post-secondary grad to, uh, to join your team and, and IREP covers typically the first six months of their salary. So that's another option that you can talk to your advisor about uh, to see if that's available. Um, for companies that are a bit larger and have been successful in Canada and have, have, have sort of sold the product in North America, if, if you're looking at expanding international, we have, we have a separate pot of money that covers international collaboration projects. Um, so this, this can be very attractive if you can co-develop a new product or an integration with an international partner. Now, the next two are newer programs, but they're also the most easily accessible. Um, so one thing we know is that a lot of companies, like all companies in Canada, but especially tech companies that may have attractive IP um, are getting, getting targeted by uh, cyber criminals. Um, so we actually have a program in place where we cover 25 hours of consulting with a cybersecurity expert to look at your company, your product, do like a penetration test and, and other things um, and provide you feedback on sort of what you need to do to plug some of the holes that you may have. Um, and those 25 hours are fully covered by IREP. So that's something that a lot of companies are taking advantage of. And it's uh, and, that, and that funding, there's a lot of funding there. So it's, it's a lot less competitive. So if you're interested in that, make sure you talk to your ITA and, and, and ask about the details for that. Um, and similar, the intellectual property uh, plan, uh, strategic planning funding that we have, um, allows you to basically work with an IP professional, typically an IP lawyer or trademark agent, to kind of look at all of your IP, all of your assets, and, and figure out how do you go about protecting that. In some cases, it might be patents, but in some cases, you might treat it as a trade secret. Well, if you trade it as a trade secret, how are you going to protect that? Uh, what are the processes you need to set up? What are your employment agreements looking like? So all those things. Um, so what IRAP does is provide funding to help you as the entrepreneur learn about IP and how to protect it, and then also cover the cost of engaging with the IP professional. Um, so it's up, up to $30,000. And again, if you're interested in that, uh, contact your ITA and, and have a discussion around that. Um, finally, we do pilot testing. 
Uh, so this is in collaboration with Innovate BC. So if you have a product that needs to be tested in a real life environment, uh, we provide funding to have you do that with a, uh, a BC-based uh, company or, or customer. So that, that's sort of the direct funding we provide. Um, we also provide indirect funding where we cover the cost of what we call services that get provided to you as a company. Um, so these are typically programs where you um, attend classes, like we have a go-to-market program and a sales acceleration program uh, where you participate and IREP covers the cost of that participation. Uh, we have a lot of programs where we cover the cost of you working with the university on some AI or machine learning type research projects. Um, we have, a, have an agreement with SFU where you can participate or use the 4D Labs equipment uh, to test your products. So those are all services where we cover the cost and you just use them and, and get the benefits from it. So it, the money doesn't come to you as a company. It's coming from IRAP to cover the cost of the services, but you get all the benefits from that. So again, lots of different options. Uh, the best thing to do is to talk to your ITA, see where you're at, and then see which ones of these make the most sense. I'll probably won't go into the details on this because I talked a bit about uh, the stable stakes, um, but IREP, uh, this is kind of our, our checklist of what we look for. Uh, we don't just look at your, your technology. We very much look at you the same way an angel investor would look. Um, and we look at the business, what's the opportunity, how big is the addressable market, um, what's your experience as a management team and your advisors, do you have any funding in place to, to not just build the product, but also then market and sell it, who's your competition, all those things. So we very much look at the business and, and assess that for suitability. And then we look at the, the project itself, if it's, if it's an R&D project that we want to fund, of how innovative is it, um, how, how, how high are the risks? Uh, we want there to be risks, but not too much, of course. And, and, and what's your ability to actually execute on it and then, then, then grow your firm if, you, if and when you build that, uh, that new enhancement to your product. So we, we look at it very holistically. Uh, the end, in, at, at the end, we're looking for companies that have a very good chance of, of growing, uh, selling their product, growing their revenues, and then start hiring people in Canada. That's, that, that's our ultimate driver, is to create jobs in Canada um, through these programs. This is another sort of checklist. Um, people always get confused because they think that these are hard and fast rules, but they're not. It's, it's really just sort of to, to make sure that you don't uh, you don't kind of think that you're further ahead than, than where you are, but um, this is what we look for. Um, it's a little bit different depending on, on each company, where you're at, which industry are you in, what kind of technology are you developing. Um, but we typically, and again, this is because it's a competitive program, we typically look for companies that are further along than just having an idea, right? Like ideally you have a prototype or an MVP build. Uh, you have some early traction with some customers using it uh, because that, that really gives you a good, good, good indication that there is product market fit. Um, we obviously look for innovation and make sure that there's, uh, there's no IP that can be developed. Um, we need you to be fully committed to the, to the venture and have, have raised some funding um, and are, are engaged with it full time. And then we look at all those market indicators, right? Like how, how big is your market? Um, do you have a good plan that is not just the product roadmap, but also a go-to-market plan and how are you going to sell this product? Um, and finally, make sure that, uh, that, that you have enough funding in place to, to match with IREP and to support the growth over time. So just things to keep in mind. So I'll take a few more minutes to kind of review some of the other programs. Um, the list is very long of government programs, so we won't be able to cover everything here, but these are some of the ones that I see most startups being able to take advantage of. Um, and, 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 and you should be aware of. Uh, my biggest recommendation though, is that you engage with uh, the innovation advisors that work for, uh, for Innovation Canada, because there's literally hundreds of government programs, but what you do is if, if you contact them, 
you actually, uh, it's typically a 20, 30 minute phone call where they learn a bit about you. Um, but they will basically, they know all these programs and they will go like, okay, based on where you're at and what you're doing, they'll tell you what the, the three, four, five best programs are that are a good fit for you and, and they can do referrals to it. So it's kind of a one-stop shop to, uh, to save yourself a lot of time and frustrating research looking at government programs online. Uh, they, they, they know these programs inside out and give you uh, custom tailored advice based on your specific, specific situation. So I'll, I'll, I'll give this information again later, but this is, this is the number one place to go to. Um, and then as you start engaging with them, you'll start learning about uh, things like the youth hiring grants. And this is probably the biggest category of, uh, of grants available that, that earlier stage companies can tap into. Um, it's all coming from Employment Canada. So they, they have the money, but they give it to what they call delivery partners. Um, and these are organizations like Innovate BC, uh, Eco Canada, um, ICTC. So they get the money and then in turn, they provide the hiring grants to the companies that they work with. Now they typically cover 50 to 75% of, uh, of, of a salary. Uh, some are a bit higher um, and, and they can go up to $20,000. And the, the hardest part of this is that they, like they, they'll open up their program and you need to be aware of that and apply right away because they sell out pretty fast. Um, this is the best time of year to start looking because our new fiscal year just kicked in on April 1st. So that means a lot of these programs are getting new money from the new budget and, and, and we'll start opening up for applications. Um, and, and the general rule is that you need to be hiring somebody that's, that's younger than 30 um, has recently graduated from a uh, post-secondary program in Canada, and and is a landed immigrant or or citizen of uh, citizen of Canada, and you're hiring them typically in their first job based on what they just studied. So it's a great way to get junior talent in um, to offset the risk of of hiring them uh, because the first few months are are covered, and of course uh, it's a good way to add some capacity to your team. Uh, without having to wait a little bit later until you raise money or, or, or get, uh, get that revenue in. Very similar to that are programs where they provide funding for you to hire an existing student, right? So this is typically co-ops uh, that you bring in for an internship, typically uh, four months or six months. Uh, the money is a little bit less because you don't pay the students that much. Um, and, and the application period is typically very seasonal. It usually goes by semesters, um, but it's a great way again to, to build out your team, get some, uh, get some cheaper labor in to, to, to contribute. And in the long term, it's a great way to, uh, to help you with your recruiting as these students will remember having worked for you. Um, here's a few links of programs that are either open or will open up soon. Uh, and like I said, you need to kind of be on the ball on this uh, because they'll open up, you need to apply and uh, they're typically done on a first come first serve basis and they, they sell out fast once they run out of funding as they allocate it. Now, this is a program for companies that are not necessarily startup based, but have a little bit of traction and, and, and have a product in market. Uh, but if you do and you're looking to go outside of Canada to the US or, or, or overseas. Um, Global Affairs Canada is a great resource to have. Um, they provide two main things. One is a service where you talk to one of the trade commissioners and they can help you with information about foreign markets and make introductions into the local market. Um, they also provide funding. The program is called Can Export, uh, where they basically cover part of your cost and these are sales and marketing expenses typically to enter a new market, right? So if you say, hey, I want to go to Australia, we're going to fly an area, attend the trade show, uh, that can cover up to 50% of those kind of expenses, up to $50,000. It's a very popular program that a lot of companies uh, can take advantage of. Uh, MyTax is, uh, is also a great program to look at. Um, it's a little bit more for advanced R&D, but if you, if you have an R&D project on the go and you need to bring in some expertise, um, basically what MyTex does is it connects you with 
post sec with, with students that have expertise in that area. And it's very similar to a co-op where you, you hire the students to work on your R&D project. Um, and they cover, in this case, uh, I think they have a temporary up, opt-it to 75% of, uh, of the money you would pay the student. It's, uh, it's, it's very good. They have business development uh, officers that basically help you find the right kind of people and the right kind of students with support from their professors to, to work with you. So it's a, it's a very good program to, uh, to again, tap into some of that talent at universities. And, and, and the bottom line is not gonna cost you a lot of, uh, a lot of cash out of pocket because they, they cover most of the uh, cost uh, of the student hiring. Now, this is a new name for something that used to be called Western Diversification. So now it's called Pacifican. Uh, they run programs to stimulate the Pacific region. Um, their two big programs are their business scale up and productivity program and their jobs and growth fund. Uh, this is typically for slightly larger companies um, because it's, it's, it's to, to grow and, and, and hire a lot of people. And instead of a grant, this is one of the examples where it's actually just a loan uh, for part of your cost that's interest free but repayable uh, towards the end of the projects. So it's a slightly less attractive, but as you as you're growing and and you want efficient and and cheap capital, it becomes a very good good option. I think this is my last one. It's called Innovative Solutions Canada. Um, they have two programs that can be attractive. So one is their challenge program, where they will literally post challenges and say, we need, we need a solution for this problem. So if that happens to be a problem that you can solve, you can get up to $150,000 to, uh, to provide that solution. Um, their testing stream is a little bit broader, uh, where you can say, hey, I have this new great product. I need somebody to use this and test this in a real-life environment. And then the government of Canada, which has a lot of different uh, departments using, using products, they will then look for a department that could use your product and test it in a real life environment. Uh, they'll pay you for the product, of course, and then you also get a reference account. So that's very interesting if you have a product that's kind of ready to be commercialized, but you're looking for that first adopter to, uh, to kind of field test your product. So that is it for me for now. Um, again, this is, this is what I would say would be my number one recommendation is that if, if you have any questions about any grants, uh, contact an innovation advisor um, and, and, and research this side, but it's best to talk to the person and they can, they can answer questions about a very broad range of programs and provide you referrals. But I'll <laughs> stop at that and I'll, I don't know, and if you want to open it for questions in person or just go down to chat. Yeah, uh, so thank you, Eric, for that. Um, we'll do a few quick questions from the chat now, and then we'll open it up to the floor for questions maybe after Sean's, Sean's talk, just so we can uh, make sure we've got time for all the content. I will say uh, I refer people to Amy and the Innovation Canada group uh, all the time, and they're very, very helpful, very responsive. and. The worst thing about uh, program portals is that they're always out of date. Well, with this innovation.canada.ca one, it's I find it quite up to date. And um, I'm in that portal, <laughs> and New Ventures is in that portal. And they, they actually reach out several times a year to update and get the latest info. So it's definitely very current. And uh, yeah, I also highly recommend it. Um, so just a few quick questions for Eric here. Uh, does the do, gov do government fund support blockchain projects as of yet? Uh, yes, if if there's a business plan behind them and and and, and they make sense. Yeah, there's no there's no specific technology area that we wouldn't fund. Um, but again, it comes down to what's what's behind us from a business perspective. Okay, uh, Josie's asking, do you qualify as a single founder if you are a solo founder and also have a few paid employees? Uh, yes, I mean, it sounds like that's an actual business. So if, yeah. Yeah, if you're a founder with employees working on something, that, uh, that, that, that should qualify for most of these programs. 
Great. Uh, there's a couple of my tax questions here, which you may or may not know the answers to, but uh, the my tax temporary bump in funding ended a few days ago. Oh, wait, no, that's, that's just a comment. Sorry. Uh, Den Dennis is asking, uh, for my tax, is it only universities or can specialist or trade schools also do projects? I know that they've expanded more to undergrads and, and I think they're doing things at like BCIT and Cap College and places like that. But yeah, that would probably be a question more for somebody at MyTech specifically to, uh, to, to get the details on. Um, my, my, my recommendation would be to, to get a referral there or contact MyTech. Uh, like I said, they have business development offices that will work with you and they can of course provide all the details on that of what would and wouldn't be eligible. Great. Uh, another question. What's the difference between technology access centers, BC Fast Pilot, and the local access to SFU labs you mentioned? Because those are all ser services. Yeah, so those are so BC Fast Pilot is a program where IREP and Innovate BC co fund uh, pilot projects. So if, if, let's say, you have a piece of hardware that, that cleans water and you want to test it, uh, we would actually cover the cost of installing that at a customer site. Uh, so that's that's sort of a funded program. The technology access centers and the SFU labs program. So those are what we would call services that we support. Um, so you can you can work with the technology access centers and contact SFU labs. And then if if your project is a good fit, uh, they would then request IREP to support that. So we would pay them to do the services for you. Okay, uh, maybe one more here. Uh, and I think Eric said he can go through the chat later. And if you've got more questions, you could put them in. Uh, okay, one more here. How recent uh, does the grad uh, okay, for, I think it's the higher, the youth program for hiring. How recent does the graduate need to be? Um, it's a little bit of a very gr grayly defined uh, cutoff. Um, it's really up to whomever runs the program to judge that. Um, at IRAP, we typically look for somebody that sort of has graduated at least in the last couple of years. Um, the, the idea behind these programs is, is to get somebody in their first full-time job that uh, builds on whatever they studied. Um, but there's a lot of exceptions to that, like, like people wow. have done a smaller job first and then, and then you hire them full-time. So I think that's very program dependent, but yeah, it, it should be, if somebody graduated seven, eight years ago, uh, they're probably in a pretty senior role and then they they wouldn't qualify for these youth programs like that uh, that's not what the programs are meant for um, it's really to get people full-time employed in their area of of, of of studies and academics okay awesome thank you eric okay so eric's going to stick around till the end so if there are more questions feel free to put them in the chat or you can hold them until the end otherwise okay. thanks thank you very much eric and to irap uh, Sean, I'm going to get you to share your screen and get set up here while Sean's doing that. I will mention that um, some of these questions are kind of just around, can you repeat this slide or what, you know, what was this you mentioned? Um, so we do have the slides posted online for you um, on our website, but here I'll just put the link right there. So if you want to just flip through the slides, some of you will probably get your answers from there. And then otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll go back to Q&A at the end here. Uh, okay, so over to Sean Hodgins from Tandem. So Sean's going to kind of talk about all this from kind of the company side and uh, also from the, the financial side. So uh, over to you, Sean. Thank you again. Yeah, thanks a lot, Angie. And, and Eric, great kind of precursor to my presentation because I've almost my entire career as an accountant, I've been doing the accounting for these programs and introducing these programs because it's such an integral part of, you know, the startup community in Canada is, is the NRC IRAP program and, and the greater government support that we have in here. So for myself, I'm, I'm the co-founder of Tandem Innovation Group. We're, we're a network of fractional CFOs, bookkeepers and controllers. I think we've well exceeded 200 across the country. And in fact, we took advantage of one of those programs in our expansion into Australia um, last year. So, so uh, but my day job is actually being a fractional CFO for many tech companies. And I've been the beneficiary of this program 
one as a participant in a system that is now called paperwork.ai that in fact was also a recipient of an NRC IRAP grant back in Riz Karaj's days. And then it's actually the backbone for how we're delivering our accounting services to many of our kind of higher growth companies and public company clients. But, but my passion is very much around red thread ventures. So I, I was involved with a couple of companies that kind of finished in the top, top three or four in this program over the time, uh, Matza Innovation, Meta Optima. And I was fortunate enough or perhaps savvy enough to realize maybe I should invest into some of these fantastic startups that many of you hopefully will be. Um, and then that actually catapulted into us creating a venture fund um, that we started at the end of 2020. It's Red Thread Ventures. It's two investment um, entities that syndicate investments, even to the earliest of stage companies. So uh, Mark Mitchell, Marco Donadeo, Jeff Manor, they, they run that, but I'm, I'm an investor in that and kind of co-founder of, of that. But that's kind of who, who I am. And certainly as an accountant, financial models is, is kind of my bread and butter. Uh, before I get into that, though, I'll just share kind of my, my experience and why I think this kind of a program and even kind of where Eric was going with, with the advice that you get with the ITAs, like Riz Karaj, for me, like he was my CTO at one of my first companies when I left public practice, and he taught me so much. And then he's been an IT, I, he, he retired a couple of years ago. But the ecosystem and Angie's community, this whole New Ventures BC community is so supportive of up and coming companies. Get that, get this advice. You, you know, obviously you're participating in this competition. So just this is, these are my kind of tips for the competition. So really, you know, it is a fantastic experience. You know, the, the, the deliverables, the deadlines, they just keep you motivated to get you know, these critical planning things done. Um, we never won the competition. I don't think we came in top 10, but boy, I don't know how many years ago, this is many, many years ago that I was in the competition. It was invaluable. In fact, one of the judges kind of gave us advice, take this software that you're developing and use it for your accounting practice, which was the, the whole concept. So for me, it was just a really good learning experience. And I came out of public practice as a CPA with Deloitte and then PwC. I knew what I knew in audit and financial reporting, but I didn't really understand the startup community, which is this learning curve that you're all on and the networking that takes in. Um, so kind of moving through this list, when you get your submissions, and, and I do wear a judge hat, so these are kind of a little things that I'd love to encourage out there beyond the modeling, but get, get a good editor. Okay. Keep, keep your presentation materials like really clear and, 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 you know, spelling, spelling mistakes, grammatical things like that, that just kind of speaks to your professionalism a little bit. Use case studies. Oh my goodness. They're so helpful. And I get into this in the financial modeling. It just makes it so easier, so much easier for investors to understand what you're, what you're, what you're explaining, because it can get very complicated, as you probably all know. Be a confident thought leader. I use it kind of the TED Talk style. Um, you need to show, like, the team is so important in these startups. Uh, so you need to be a confident thought leader, like innovation. I think a question came through, what's a technology company? So obviously if you're developing intellectual property, patentable material, but truly innovating something is, is comes through, through being you know, a domain area expert and then applying uh, you know, a solution to a problem, okay? An interesting story, dumb it down, not a lot of acronyms, but really explain what it is that you're solving is, is a part of even the financial model. Like the, 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 as I'm gonna get into it, it's like your story is translated into numbers, but make it an interesting story. And it, you can unlock some of the interest by knowing your numbers. So that's kind of a segue. Also, 
historically, the financial model section of this competition is notoriously poorly rated. So please step it up this year because Angie's going to boot me here at some stage because I'm, I, I, I really, I'm, you know, trying to get you guys to, to, to really spend some time fully understanding how to articulate your financial model more effectively. So this, you know, definitely you want to spend some time in the process of really understanding your financial model and more importantly, articulating it in a way that's understandable and, and compelling. Okay. And then the other really important thing of this whole process is don't be afraid to ask for help. Like myself, Eric, and others that are in this community, we're here to help. Like we're innately entrepreneurial. Like for me, and you wouldn't be here if you weren't as well. So it's always like, hey, what's the next innovative idea? I love concepts, but boy, it's a lot of work to con convert a concept or an idea into a business. But I've been spending most of my career doing that. Reach out ask for help and, and this will translate into either sales opportunities or ultimately investments so that you can get your matching funds so that Eric and the team at, at the NRCI wrap might be more interested in supporting your vision. So, so now I'm just gonna kind of get into the, the, the bread and butter. What is a financial model? Like in, in the guy Kawasaki investor, like what is, what slide is this? Is this this slide? Is it the opportunity slide? Is it the financial statements? And the answer is it's, it's actually an encapsulation of, of a bunch of the, of the materials that are in this competition, as well as in your standard investor deck. But foundationally, what you want to get to is, is financial statement projections or pro forma financials, which are historical, demonstrating what your historical performance is in, in accounting language, of course, as well as where are you going from here? Three to five years projected information, okay? Pro formas being just different scenarios, okay? If we did this, this is what we think the outcome will be. If we did plan B, this is the alternative. So th th this is foundationally what we're looking at when you're, when you're building your financial model. Um, and, and it's your ability to um, present what you think your company can do without doing anything but thinking in front of Excel, right? Build your company in Excel first, because boy, if you can't do it in Excel, it's gonna be really, really hard to do it in, for real, right? So I just use this as a typical example. And some of the best financial models that I've run into, you'd think they're all coming from accountants. They come from the engineers. Um, and, and it's innately, I think, an engineering thing that you kind of want to model out your, your numbers. Most sophisticated financial models that I've seen come from engineers. They're building mines or big power plants. And these are very complicated engineering models. But you don't need to be an accountant to do a good financial model. We'll get, we'll get into what you need to know. And often some of the stuff isn't generally accepted accounting principles. It's driven off of other more important key performance indicators or critical um, performance measures tied to whatever industry that you're in, okay? And then most importantly, this financial model drives your valuation. Certainly if you're in the situation where you're needing to raise capital, convince your rich aunt that she should invest in your company, you need to be able to show how, is, how are you gonna increase the value of your business through executing on use of proceeds. I give you $100,000, what are you gonna do with it? This gives you a little bit of a tool to show them what exactly you're gonna do and how are you gonna turn this into value, okay? So I, I, I added another step this year in, in hopes of hopefully improving the general quality here, but it, it's, it's a process. Like your financial model is such an important piece of your business. I describe the rest of it as, as you, you know, your marketing and your story and what's the problem we're solving and what's the solution and in intellectual property um, that you're going to protect. But the financial model kind of weaves it all together in an understandable kind of numeric <laughs> measurement. And it really doesn't stop. It becomes the foundation of how you're operating month to month. When do we run out of cash? 
when are we hiring who and what are we paying them? And for me, the, the financial models that I've spent my career building become the budgets of of the businesses and they become the framework to which all our board meetings run and the operational guidance and cadence of the business runs on the financial model. So again, it is really an important thing that really never stops and it's a process, okay? And the process that you need to kind of go through that I'm, I'm gonna walk you through is this opportunity analysis, like understanding the industry that you're in and where is it that you're going to play? Understanding a little bit of the mechanics of what's happening as an owner of a business, like selling things, marketing what you're doing, selling it, converting this to invoices and revenue, and then ultimately collecting the cash is very much what we're modeling in our financials. And then, and then, but, but what, where are these numbers coming from? And they, they are kind of, again, in kind of this kind of new category that I'm going to try to spend a little more time on is, which is these KPIs, these key performance indicators. They're not accounting lingo. They're specific to the industry. They're probably things that you're very comfortable in understanding in the businesses that you're starting. The, the other really important one that's often lacking is just your gross margin. At the end of the day, how much profit are you going to get on the services, the product offering, the software solution, the blockchain solution that you're going to roll out? Like how much money do you at the end of the day make? And this is so sometimes lacking out there. And then the last bit is just how does this all flow into time-based performance? What are our critical milestones for success? And how does this reflect some measure of valuation of your business as you're looking to either raise capital or just continue to grow your business? Okay. And the last one in that this is a process is case, uh, this is going to be a little bit of case studies, case studies, case studies, but they are really, really important in my mind for helping convey complicated issues. Every one of you is starting a business that is innately complicated. So to the degree you can find and dumb it down for a kind of dumb investors like myself, you need to use these kind of tools that will improve the quality of how you're articulating your financial model and your business itself. Okay. So, so step one, and I just fire away with the questions. I'm going to try to go quickly so we can open up for lots of questions at the end. But step number one is really understanding your opportunity. And I don't know how many investor decks the Red Thread team went through this year, but a lot. I, I think we made over 20 investments. So we probably saw over 100 investor decks. But this is what I describe as kind of the first few seconds of the pitch is, 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 is this TED Talk style. You immediately know, does this person actually know their industry really well? And it's, it's a little bit hard to see, you know, it's this opportunity slide, it's this concentric circles of our, you know, our, you know, our, our tangible uh, market opportunity and what's our particular slice of this. These slides are often way too generic. And a, a kind of foundational bit of understanding your financial model is really explaining these circles in a way that's enlightening to the investor and really paints a picture that ah, uh, you actually know exactly the niche within this market. We had a presentation this week from like a pet food um, supplements company. And it was like, oh, we're in an $8 billion industry, right? And, but there, and it was like, oh, we're gonna capture some percentage of like, I don't know, it was like 5%. But it, but and I was actually looking through as a part of this, can I find a good example of where this has been done well? I couldn't, because they're almost all generic. It's like, oh, we're a part of a $27 billion industry, a billion dollar industry. <laughs> it's yes, investors are keen to make investments where there's big opportunity, but you have to articulate like where you fit in with some informative information like some really conveying some expertise in that industry and and that's what's often lacking as a foundation to your business model 
right? Your financial model is going to build on, we will at the end of the day, capture some market share of what could be a multi-billion dollar opportunity. But it's the assumptions and the understanding of the industry and where the problems are within the industry that become interesting. And they become foundations for which you can model out some predictions that become meaningful. So, so this is where I would, when you get to this part of your presentation material, really do a better job of explaining these concentric circles. Because it's the story and the assumptions that are around it that are much more valuable than just putting, the, putting it out there. It doesn't, it's meaningless to just kind of throw a worry in a part of a big industry and we'll get 1% of it. It just doesn't show any real insight. Okay. So, yeah. And then, and then it's like, okay, how, what, you know, what is this, this circle that we're going to target? You know, why, why, you know, and this is where it kind of segues out of the rest of your story as a business. Is it, we, we, we're marketing a better product. We've got some intellectual property that we've patented and we're going to, you know, change the world of water uh, filtration or what it, whatever it might be. And so that needs to be a foundation for where you're making your market assumptions, like how we're going to get more, more customers. And so telling this story and overlapping it with estimates that flow into your financial model become key to telling your financial model or building your financial model. And then it's, you know, growth rates, you know, it's just your financial model is over time and it needs to be um, realistic and build in some sensitivities to, okay, if, if COVID strikes or if, you know, some, 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 some issue comes about that you have understood that you can't predict perfectly what will happen in the future. This is all a part about financial modeling. And part of it is just showing and conveying that you've thought about it and that you're a savvy planner and that you're going to take someone's investment money and put it to good use, properly thinking about it in advance, okay? From there, we go to um, step two, which is really, kind of the plain vanilla financial model, you know, who's going to buy, you know, what you're selling and when, and it sometimes starts like in our financial model template, this Excel tab is blank. It really should come from the CEO and it should be you thinking about what the problem is and what you're selling. What is the price that you're going to charge? How are you delivering your product? Is it software? Is it services? It is, is it a product that you need to manufacture? Is it outsourced, et cetera? And just explaining it in numbers in a way that's very understandable. The other one that I often throw it is who's going to buy it? Put it right into your financial model. Find your first 10 customers by just contemplating or going onto Google and finding out if you don't already know this, it's, 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 it's probably a bit, a bit of an indicator, but build it into your financial model, right? Okay, we're going to sell to this customer at this time. And that actually propels other very valuable startup things. Let's reach out and talk to them. Hey, we're thinking about building this. Let's get a letter of intention, like a non betty letter of intention. And then, oh, we can validate these numbers and these assumptions. And then we sell the customer one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now you've got a basis in reality to rolling out your three to five year predictions. But often you'll see very theoretical financial models and there's no, there's no tangible case study. There's no names of customers. It's harder to relate to the reasonability of the numbers without these kind of stories embedded into your models, okay? And then, and then it's like, why are they buying? You know, are we cheaper than everyone else? Are we a premium product? Is it that if they buy our service or our software, we're going to, they're going to save money, their own internal rate of return is going to be greater? these kind of traditional marketing type things that are conveyed, they have to be reflected in the financial statements and the financial model that is the backbone of your business. 
So this is how it all translate in our little slide there that just says, hey, if you can't make it work at a million dollars, you're never going to get to the billion dollars. So I, 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 you know, it's kind of the concept here a little bit. Start small and build from there. And then this, this one is where it's like, you don't need to be an accountant to do this. In fact, some of the worst models I've seen have come from accountants because they don't, they don't understand the foundational issues that the company is trying to solve. Um, and this becomes metrics of, you know, sometimes we'll run into a company. We saw a company last week that is looking to get into or leverage as an online sales um, leveraging social media. So it was, became a very easy Google search on, well, what are your metrics? Like, what are your KPIs in, in you, you know, the number of YouTube followers that you might have, right? So, and these be kind of interesting metrics that you can think about in advance, right? Before you start selling a product, you need to have a community of followers, right? So th these aren't in financial statements anywhere, but they become important. How many people are in your organization is actually an important KPI. Are you a one person? Like I kind of, kind of came up with the NRC. It's like, if you're a solo, solo person, I use the example of, you know, a business is, a, is, is, is greater than one person, right? It, it, you've got to build a team for success. So if you've got a co-founder or if you've built a fundamental management team around a concept, that means that they've committed Right, it comes down to how committed are you to building this business, and that's a really important KPI. Like, if you've got three people that have fundamentally agreed with you that you should quit your day job and start this, this is extremely compelling, right? As opposed to I'm doing this on the side of my desk as a part time job, it just doesn't say the same thing. But this translates to more meaningful KPIs, okay? Customer account, how many do we have? And then more complicated things like what is the cost to acquire these companies? And this is where you start to model out, well, we need to run ads and we need to spend time doing demos. And then we need to sell the product in as a free trial for 30 days. And then they, we need to monitor how they're using it. And then they may adopt it. And then they may ultimately either be satisfied. So customer satisfaction statistics churn rates, which means, hey, I liked it for a while, but then I got out. So these are just kind of generic key performance indicators that become foundations to really good financial models. Okay. And then ultimately, it's like more foundational. When do we break even um, and, and we'll kind of move to step three or step four here. Okay. So from, from understanding all these KPIs of your business that'll have specific nuances to each one of your business and everyone's KPIs are typically different. I picked some standard ones for kind of software or SaaS type soft, uh, solutions, but kind of moving into at the end of the day, do you make money, right? Like what we are when we sell or provide these services, what's the gross margin? And I use... Over my career, I don't know if you can see it very well, but Matza, so Ben Lightburn, my CEO there, was just this fantastic young entrepreneur who's done extraordinarily well for himself. But he had such an elegant pitch. Like he was one of the best investment pitchers. That, and we had this one slide that, that explained what was kind of started as a very complicated technical story, which is in this case, it was using this proprietary water extraction technology. But at the end of the day, we had a very simple way of explaining how this company was going to make money. So we could buy cranberry pomace from, you know, Ocean Spray or any of these, they would, they would extract the juice to make cranberry juice. But in the pomace, the leftover garbage that was at best sold for pet food additives was a whole bunch of these really valuable phytochemicals, proanthocyanidins in this case. So we just had a financial model that says we can buy a ton of this pomace for about $1,000. And then we run it through our pure water proprietary extraction technology. And we get about 42 kilograms of this 8% proanthocyanidin extract, which is really good for 
um, uh, urinary tract infections and other uh, health benefits. And this sells for around $11,000, okay? It's so elegantly simple, but so easily explains kind of the entire value proposition of what is a very complicated business at the end of the day. So often you'll see and you'll look at an investor deck and you'll go through it and there'll be all this material, but these foundational number stories, like how much money is there potentially to be made here are often lacking. So I just use this as a really good example of being able to articulate this kind of gross margin issue very succinctly and easily understood. Okay, but there's a whole bunch of other metrics like economies of scale early on, you might be selling prototypes, there might be improvements to the products, you might make lose money early on, while you're asking the government for some assistance while you're doing pilot stuff. So that's where you've got all this support, and you model it out that way. It's like early on, we're probably going to lose, we will lose money. That's why we're asking for investment. But over time, as as this product gets proven and we get uh, adoption and traction from sales, we will build economies of scale in that will turn this into profit. That's where this all has to be modeled out in advance, okay? Last step, okay, is valuation. So I, I'm always asked, okay, well, what's the value of my company? And, but it all ties in, like it all ties in to these financial models is that, and I, I use the simple example. If you go to like a certified valuator, like there's professional CPAs that become, you know, chartered business valuators, it all, they all come down to the same thing, which is the net present value of all your future cash flows is what's the value of your company. Right. The, but the reality is it's there's an art, right? There's much more that goes into it. But it's important for you folks to understand that that's fundamentally what the real value is. And then you can run a calculation. And I use it as just just compare your business to a GIC, you know, a guaranteed investment certificate. If I had a million dollar GIC that paid you know, 10% and I could generate uh, $100,000 a year from a GIC, which is basically no risk. What's the value of that business? It's a it's million dollars, okay? It just runs in perpetuity. So the issue is then you have to build a model that shows, well, what will our future cash flows be? And this becomes a driver to what your valuation will be over time. Okay, so this is kind of the final step of what, you know, why am I building this? Well, because somebody's going to ask you, well, I'm, you're going to ask them to write a check to invest in your company. You have to explain this. You have to show them how you arrived at these values. And usually it's like, oh, well, this other company that's in our same industry, they got bought for you know, $100, $100 million last year. So we must be worth at least $20 million. This garbage, right? It's like, no, no, no. Show me exactly that, like that company was properly funded. And it comes down to, have you spent the time building out a financial model that can show, show somebody that you can actually achieve the same thing. Then that basis of logic starts to make sense. But often there's no model. It, it's just some assumption that, oh yeah, we're gonna be 10% as good as they were. <laughs> it's too much of a shortcut. And too many companies, too many startups, too many startup CEOs are, are just jumping this, this, this gap. They, they need to solve for this, okay? But it comes down to the, kind of the rest of the story, like what's our team? What's the technology that we have? Has it been patented? What's this opportunity and do we really understand it well? And then what's the risk profile? And then if you can articulate all of this into your financial model, into your numbers, then it all comes together. It all starts to make sense. Now, the industry, and once you've got it together, you know, valuations are driven on other metrics, like multiples of revenue, like top line revenue, multiples of income, 
in the olden days, when I was a, the manager on PMC Sierra, like early tech success local here in Vancouver. And when PMC was buying a company every quarter, I remember the measure was like, it was like a million dollars per engineer in the company at the, in the heyday of the tech bubble. So it was just, sometimes there's simple metrics that you need to know. And that's where it's like, you need to understand your industry well enough to know how does the industry value you. But it does come back to this foundational financial model. Do we have all our numbers together so I can prove to you that if we execute, we will have these kind of cash flows that would warrant these types of values. Okay, and then, and then the last bit is just timelines. Okay, timelines for raising additional capital if you need to grow. Um, when will you get bought? When will you go IPO? Because you need to convey to an investor, or in this case, like the judges, like, why am I excited about this? And it's typically because this is going to be, you know, change the world, you know, improve, you know, the ESG mes metrics, like make the world a better place, innovate, make, and then the issue is, okay, we'll get, we'll get bought, or we'll go public and increase the value to everybody. So you need to, you need to have that in your story. Um, this is this is this is I think my last slide here. So at the end of the day, and this is a very detailed slide, but I'm just pointing out: yes, you do need to build financial statements. Okay, and in this case, this is a, a a profit and loss statement, an income statement, and it's showing historical numbers, so our actual numbers. But you'll you'll notice that the most the, the, the significant information on here is the line items of what are we selling and what does it cost to sell so that we can drive gross margins or gross profit and so that you can see the trends. Is it trending up? Is it trending flat? What are the margins that we're making? Are we seeing economies of scale? Um, because this all becomes the roadmap to, to how you're going to run your business. Okay. And then I categorize expenses in a different way. Like sometimes like, you think, oh, bank charges and legal fees and wages and all that's, that's kind of a mom and pop business. But most of these businesses, you're focusing on what category of spend is it R and D right? Innovation. Are we innovating here? Because we'll get NRC support or shred SRNED tax credits. But that's where early on you want to see a lot of spend there because that's building the great technology, right? And then sales and marketing. How much are we spending here as we ramp up sales? And then g and is just being a category of, okay, we want to keep g and relatively lean early on because you want to spend all your money in these other more important categories. Okay, so it's all then just what do we think is going to happen in the future. And this is a very typical example of a relatively comprehensive financial model that is tied to a, an even more comprehensive model on full balance sheet, cash flow projections, etc. But at the end of the day, this is what an investor is kind of looking for to see that does all of it all add up? is what, what you're telling me in the story makes sense when we look at the financial numbers. And is this interesting? Okay. Most of you will just have this thing called a hockey stick. Everybody has the same slide. They're all exactly the same. They're all hockey stick. So it really just comes down to how do we get to this hockey stick? And does it actually make any sense? Okay. Um, yeah, these are just some concluding marks. How am I doing for time, Angie? Uh, yeah, you're pretty good. You can go through them. Pretty good. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, just in conclusion, you, you know, just try to keep it simple. I, I I know I went through a lot of a lot of material here, but it is this case study. I kind of push it back to just try to keep it simple. And using a case study approach is is really helpful. Enlighten the judges. Enlighten the investors. This TED Talk approach, right? And when you can articulate your numbers really succinctly and know, hey, this is my industry. These are our competitors. This is how much they're selling. It just, it just tells a much more compelling story. Okay. 
Go find competitors, go find a public company, go to cdar.com or in the US it's sec.gov. There are tens of thousands of public companies. Go find one that's in your industry and look at their numbers, read their MDNA, read their 10K documents and see how they're telling their stories because this will help you professionalize how you're telling your story, okay? And then, and, then, and then use Google. Just make sure your story stands up on quick Google searches. Because I don't know, every time I'm listening to a pitch deck, I'm on Google, just checking to make sure what I'm hearing is consistent with an easy search. So I think if you can nail all of what I've said, and I know it's, it's a biggie, um, your chances of being successful in this competition go way up. But just generally building your business, like these are just really what I've seen in my career. The folks that are doing a really good job of this are building some fantastic businesses. And I, I know from my experience with the folks at the NRC, they love these models too, because it's foundational to their decisions on, is this a company that we should be as a government, as a people of Canada investing into? And if you've done this work, it goes a long way to, to, to providing that, that, that due diligence material. I'm happy to open up some questions at the awesome. stage. Great, thank you very much, Sean. I like, I like the new additions you made, very nice. I'm going to add, uh, I'm gonna add Eric here to our, our spotlight. So you can ask questions for both Sean or Eric at this point. Um, just to start a couple for Sean that have kind of been here in the chat. Uh, so, when you put up that uh, example of projections, I'm sure this comes up a lot with you, Sean. The question is, do you have a template or do you have a recommended template that we can use? And yeah, do you, yeah. I have a template. I'll, I'll send it over to you, Angie, to send yeah. out. Um, awesome. Yeah, you'll see it, 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 it's, it's a bit of a, it's, it's a little daunting to non-accountants, but I point back to there's one slide that I, I kind of explain in that template conceptually what's going on. And it's back to these KPIs. That's where you need to spend your time. Then you could frankly give it to an accountant. Or again, our network is all about you know CFOs and, and accountants that are keen to help out here. We can plug it in and make it balanced, so to speak, so that it articulates this well. But it's, it's, it's really this one slide that really, or one sheet that helps even the accountant understand exactly what you're selling, when you're selling it, how you're delivering it in layman's language. And, and that's, that's the tricky bit here. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so I'm just gonna do a couple. So we've got about 12 minutes to go. So we do have a good amount of time for Q&A. Um, you can put your questions in the chat or you can put your hand up. We're happy to unmute you so you can ask yourself. Uh, if you have to run, that's okay too. I will just say next week's topic is sales and marketing 101 on Tuesday instead of Wednesday. So we'll send you a reminder, uh, but please do join us for that. Otherwise, thank you for joining us. Uh, and we're just gonna get into questions for the next 10 minutes or so. So if I see a hand up, I will add you to uh, Spotlight to unmute and ask your question. But for now, let's just take a look at some of the questions. Uh, so for Sean, uh, okay, so, in round two of the competition, uh, so this is a competition related question, but applies to all startups really, that we do ask for when people are describing their financials to use a bottom up financial model to predict sales. Uh, so they're asking, does this imply that we use bottom up, the bottom up approach to estimate the company's uh, serviceable obtainable, obtainable market to TAM, or does the SOM market size um, need to be used in the financial projections? Yeah, what I was explaining using those KPIs is all about a bottom up model, right? That's the, the top down is like, hey, we're in a $8 billion opportunity and we're going to get 1% of it. It's, it's meaningless, right? So uh, much better is start at the bottom, like really articulating what the problem is and what are we going to sell? Because you have to explain how you're going to capture market share at a more foundational level. And th that is this one magic Excel spreadsheet that, that, that's just really articulating in your in number format how you will how you'll gain market share. And then get your first 10 customers 
And then you can start running assumptions up. Okay, well, if we can get it for 10 customers and you know, we might sell it to 100 and, 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 and get you know, 20% buying and then, and then show historically that, that, that this is how we're performing, then we can run up numbers that, that become big and then fold into the, okay, now it makes sense that I believe you can get 5% of this big market because I understand how you're going to get there. That's what a bottoms up approach is all about. Great. Yeah. And the reason we actually had made that adjustment to the financials question a few years ago now, because, uh, and, I, and if you went to Mike Volker's presentation last week, you know, he talked about how angel meetings they have, I think that he called it the BS bingo card, um, where, you know, if someone checks off all these boxes, then they stop paying, they stop listening. And one of them was the whole, you know, there's 10 million people on earth. So if we can get just 1% of that, then we're fine. So we're trying to avoid that. We want, we want yes. to have the numbers grounded from the bottom up. That's kind of why we, we made that change in the question. Um, okay, so for Eric, uh, Patrice is asking, are you aware of any grants available for supporting the creation of a facility to house the innovation? Well, the question is if there's grants to buy equipment or or buy a building or rent rent facilities um there's no grants as in here's money go go buy it um if if, if you are have to invest in land or buildings or equipment i know there's some government-backed loans you can apply to through your bank uh, because those those hard things count as collateral um but it, it's still a loan right so the business or you as a personal person need to need to provide guarantees as well. Um, the, the other exception is if you're a really big company, um, there's something called the strategic investment fund. So they, they, they give companies 10 millions and, and, and higher um, funding. So in the last couple of years, I think a couple of, Canadian, of, of Vancouver companies got money there to build some facilities, but they were all, I think they were biotech companies that's we're doing uh, big investments in, in local facilities to create vaccines and stuff like that. So for startups, it's probably very unlikely you will get a grant or anything else that will be attractive enough to cover the cost of hardware um, or, or specific facilities. Most, most of funding programs are for employee cost. Um, that, that, that's the bulk of it. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so if just a, in general, a few people are asking about recording and where to find the templates. So we'll post them to our, our, our page where we post all the videos and the slides um, and we'll send that out. Uh, one more question here for projections. Uh, does it help to see historic information as well? Do you want us to redo our information in the lab, or do you want us to read, let me just read this carefully. And do you want us to redo our information into the high level version shown presented or a detailed version? Is a detailed version acceptable if we've already built that? Well, my answer to that is you want a, you want a summary version, right? What I'm showing you is once, they're, once you've caught their attention, they're gonna drill into a more meaningful presentation of materials. So what I was probably a little overkill for this, but I, Angie may correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, historical is very valuable. Historical shows traction. Um, it, it shows that you have at least the sophistication to do some level of accounting. Right, like you're asking somebody to invest in your company, you can show even if it's moderate. Even I saw somebody was asked the question: If I'm working full time but not paying myself, it's like you should kind of try to get a little more sophisticated. Canada is really good for paying yourself a nominal amount. So you don't, we don't even charge income taxes up to a certain threshold. So why you wouldn't at least be paying yourself that, short of your CPP withholdings? But that you know. So anyway, it is a little bit of just your historicals just shows some level of sophistication on what you're doing, where you're at in your life cycle. And, and then, and then, but it is really all about the future. So, so you don't need to go overkill on the past, but some, some past is very helpful. It just shortcuts. When were you incorporated? Uh, you, you know, how many, it gives you a little bit of foundational financial information that becomes a basis of your future model. That's all. All right, great. Well, thank you very much, Sean and Eric. 
I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to spend with all the companies. We actually had, uh, we had the most attendees so far this year today, over 120 at one point. So this topic uh, was clearly popular. So thank you for- uh, Free, for free er Eric's, Eric's gonna draw them in every time. Yeah. Government Eric. money, so everyone's loving that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so yeah, so appreciate you all, you all joining us today. Uh, we will make the slides available. Eric and Sean, thank you again. And uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to, uh, to follow up. Otherwise, have a great rest of your day, everybody. Good luck, everyone. Take care. Okay, bye, you. everyone. Thank you. Thanks again.